Hi there. Welcome to the Health Analytic Insights Podcast. This podcast is all about creating a community of like-minded individuals who are passionate about the field of health informatics. I hope to share information and advice in topics such as health analytics, digital health, biomedical engineering, and data visualization in healthcare. And in exchange, I would love to hear from you, dear listener, about your experience and interest in this field. You can drop me a line at healthanalyticinsights at gmail.com. And this email, along with any references discussed during this podcast, will be listed in the show notes below. If this resonates with you, don't forget to follow and subscribe to this podcast, as I'll be releasing new episodes bi-weekly. Welcome everyone to the Health Analytic Insights Podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I'm so excited to speak to Asia Spears, who's the creator and founder of Rose Data Studio, an organization whose purpose is to develop a diverse data workforce and provide health equity through data consulting and training. Again, Asia, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast, and let's dive straight into it. Asia, can you introduce yourself to the audience, give a bit about your background and origin story, and tell the audience about how you got to where you are today? Sure, I'm happy to, Elena. And thanks so much for having me here today. So my background is steeped in math and biostatistics. Uh, that's where I started out. And I've been kind of moving and kind of along a continuum, I guess, over the last several years where I initially got my bachelor's in math from Spelman College, had a very strong interest in public health and decided to go to pursue biostatistics um, at the UCLA School of Public Health. And uh, really had a great time there. I learned a lot and actually realized that I love policy and that mm. there was a lot of cool ways to use all the data skills that I had on a grander scale. So mm -hmm. I started a program at the Party Van Graduate School in policy analysis, pursuit of my PhD. I've taken a three-year leave of absence and I'm actually really excited to get back to that this fall. And so hopefully in a few years, I'll be all done and complete my PhD in policy analysis. So I'm really excited about that. Oh, that's really, really cool. I have my background in biomedical engineering, and I was um, completely amazed by how many different fields that data kind of touches and how it can impact it. That was like one of the biggest things that really um, resonated with me. So it's awesome that you're able to kind of even uh, weave your way into, into policy like that from your biostatistics background. It's really cool. Yeah. It's been a fun journey and I just have been calling it my data journey because I've been just as surprised as you have. What? There's other people who use R and SAS. Like, let's talk. What do you do? How do you use it? So it's been really exciting to encounter others and see how they use the same tools and what kinds of problems they're solving. Mm -hmm. And it seems like specifically you're very interested in topics such as health equity and data storytelling. And I was wondering, since you started your company, did you see gaps in these areas that you could fill? Could you speak a bit about why you pivot towards mainly health equity and, and data storytelling? Yeah, sure. So I think Rose Data Studio really started out of my own experience as being a tutor and a TA for statistics courses and for kind of students in different programs who were taking statistics. And so I had a really interesting experience as a tutor on the WiseAmp platform where I was getting like nursing students and mm -hmm. um, people who are in business school. And I was like, wow, we're all, we're all working with data. And in kind of the one stream that was kind of constant with working with a lot of clients was this idea of how do you take not only the, like the statistical or an analytic concepts, the notation, as mm -hmm. well as the code, and then <laughs> make it all make sense. How do you bring all that together? And so I started to really see data storytelling as a culmination of all of that incredible, incredibly hard work. And I see kind of two sides to it. My, my definition of, of data literacy involves kind of knowing what to Google to kind of get yourself out of a pickle or to, mm -hmm. you know, solve any kind of programming error you come up against. And then also the ability to convey the importance and the impact of the work that you did to stakeholders who 
aren't really going to care how long it took to, you know, run the model, but you can talk to your peers and your colleagues about that kind of thing. And Mm -hmm. so I realized that really it was just powerful to kind of be on this interface between like that technical backend as well as that Mm -hmm. client facing space. And so I really love being in this space. And so I want to help other people, no matter how much or how little or whatever combination of data skills makes sense for the path that they're on, that they just feel confident in Mm -hmm. moving forward with either talking to their statistician or moving forward to learn Python or pursuing a deeper focus in data visualization. And so by setting up Rose Data Studio, I got to really market to that type of uh, person or Mm -hmm. um, organizations or schools who are looking for that type of training. So it's really been exciting. So just kind of past the two-year mark of Rose Data Studio, and I'm excited. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. And I think there's a lot of value in that. Data storytelling is, you know, very, very hard. I think people might think, oh, you're just like maybe creating a picture from a, a graph, but it's there's so many layers to it. I know you, I think you primarily work with Tableau. Yes, that was okay. the number one. And even I'm like re kind of re um, upping my training in that because mm-hmm. I initially trained on it in like 2014 to 2015 and things have changed with the software. And yeah. so I'm like working on my own training and hope to be certified by the end of the year. Awesome. Um, Yeah. It's when it comes to not only kind of knowing, okay, how do I have to set up my data, but then how does, you know, how does the person that I'm sending this report to actually want to receive it? And as exciting and wonderful as I think Tableau Reader is, I remember the first time I was asked to put it in a PDF and I was like, (laughs) Yes. Why, why would I do that? And it was just kind of that reminder. It's like the data storytelling isn't all about me. It's about the person who mm-hmm. is working to kind of craft a strategy and needs this insight mm-hmm. to help them move forward. It's about the patients or health plan members that are being mm-hmm. served by these value-based care programs um, and about the like kind of nudges that we'll be able to kind of offer um, mm-hmm. if we can tell a strong story and really have a command of what this process is is really telling us. So I had to kind of get out of my own head in some ways and really put on mm-hmm. more of a consulting hat, but I, I really enjoy it. And of course, fun, cool things that maybe never see the light of day yeah. or, you, you know, <laughs> jump over to your, your best friend's cubicle and show it off to them or take it to a conference or something. I think there's always outlets for, for all those things. And there's meetup groups and all kinds of ways to, to have even your, your own needs met as and explore as a scientist, as a researcher. And so I think I always make sure I look for those outlets as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm more of a Power BI user. It's the same thing. It doesn't really matter what the tool is. But as you're saying, you have to meet the needs of the external group that you're serving. So if they want it in a PDF and you've created this um, cool, interactive (laughs) visual, you've got to meet them where they're at. I think that it really helps to develop those communication skills because as you're saying, it's not really about you. So you kind of have to eat a bit of humble pie, take a step back and and kind of look big picture. What am I trying to create? How are, is the thing that I'm going to create actually advance someone else's policy or help them understand their clinical practice a bit more? So yeah, you're wearing a lot of different hats. You're a communicator, you're, you have the technical aspect and you're kind of like a translator between yes. both both sides, both the technical side and the and the stakeholder side. So yeah, it's definitely really a different and really interesting job. It's never a, a dull moment. No, not <laughs> but, at all. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I like what you said about sometimes you might feel, oh, I work so hard on this, but just trying to find different groups, different outlets where you can kind of geek out with other people if what you've created doesn't necessarily have to go into the garbage bin. You can share it with your coworkers. Yes presenting it at different conferences, data visualization conferences, mm-hmm. um, still putting your work out there and showing off your work, but um, also realizing that you have to kind of look at things big picture. So that's really great advice. And going a bit off topic, since it's been over two years of you know, your company, uh, Rose Data Studio being founded, what are some of the biggest business lessons that you've kind of learned from mm. starting this initiative? Oh, that's a great question. I think it's know your own personal kind of working style and what Mm -hmm. works for you and also your lifestyle. (laughs) So I was working on a project earlier this year and I was just like, um, I'm never again going to do an analysis project on my own. (laughs) So I've actually joined a team for doing uh, data analysis projects. So I'm like subcontracting with another like organization that's also kind of run by a peer that I met who's also a data entrepreneur, public health space 
space as well. So it's been fantastic, a fantastic partnership. We just finished our, our first project together and I'm like, this is great. I could keep doing this <laughs> together with the team versus just on my own. I'm also looking and preparing another proposal right now. And I already reached out to someone. I was like, hey, I need to develop this. And I think no, you're an expert in this space. How can we work together? And just being very honest about the level of support that I wanted. She said, I could either be more of a coach and we can kind of meet on an hourly basis here or there, or I can actually have more concrete deliverables. I was like, yes, let's do the deliverables thing because I am, um, I realize, and I'm trying to just figure out how do I balance this, especially as I am returning to my PhD program. I think a lot, I think a lot about things. <laughs> And so I don't want to soak up so much time going into the depths of, into the unknown and my thoughts and wondering about things. And then I'm on a really tight timeline. And so I think having people who I know exactly how they can support me and my endeavors and me having the big picture and the content knowledge that it, it all has been working out really well. And so with this awesome. team I'm consulting with, I really help a lot with leads, project leads, and because people know what I do, I'm, I love LinkedIn. And so mm -hmm. I've really been able to help us find people who are interested in our services through that platform. And then when it comes to the data visualization, uh, I really focus on how are we like, aesthetically as a setup and then also mm -hmm based on the needs of the project, how, how does the dashboard or visualizations we've created help really meet the needs of the client? So it's mm -hmm. kind of a perfect fit for me. I would say I've learned not to wear all the hats <laughs> because that's <laughs> too much. I want to have enough time set aside for deep thinking. And that's really important for me. Yeah, I think it's it's so important to know know yourself, that analytical mind can be, have pros and cons, but I think that it, the pro is that you're always constantly thinking, oh, is this right for me? Is this not right for me? I think that that's interesting because you kind of hear a lot of people who start throwing a business, they have to wear all the ha the hats, right? And it's difficult to relinquish that control when it's like your baby, but it's great that you're able to just be able to kind of relinquish that control and and see which areas work best for you and 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 help you grow. That's that's not an easy task at all. Yeah, no, yeah. I appreciate that. And I mean, some of it has been hard learned because I'm like, well, I have, well, she doesn't want me to call her baby, but I have a toddler. And so <laughs> it's like, well, she's a real person too. And yeah. to meet her needs as well as thinking about how to set business milestones and what, what does ambition look like? And what does that mean having a family? And so mm -hmm. I've had to be really conscious about how I'm managing my energy. And so Mm -hmm. uh, I think the best thing for me has been to call in the right people and it's been wonderful. <laughs> so awesome. I would say compared to the way I'm feeling this week, compared to the way I was feeling the weekend after I finished that other project, much, much better. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think that'll just like help you balance as you go through your PhD and all these types of things, right? You don't want to burn out or any of these, these difficult things that can cause you to step back from things that you love so much. Right. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So I think it's the experience is, is helping me um, now, but yeah, it's kind of knowing when and how to say no, thinking about mm -hmm. alternatives or even saying, I have thought about this a lot. I don't have alternatives right now, but I, you know, really need to be honest about where I'm at at this point. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. when it comes to that, that strategic communication, that comes into play there too, because being able to communicate your boundaries, to understand and maybe sit with that discomfort if the person you're speaking to is upset, which they rightfully may be, but knowing that you made the choice that was best for you in the long run, I think is you always can live with that at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, getting back to health equity, can you talk a bit about your interest in maternal and child health and how do you see data analytics making a difference in these areas? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, I've had what well, I would say I have interest in all kinds of areas, but yes, I would say maternal and child health is something that is very close to my heart. And then I, I would say just in terms of data, it's, I think the way it's not only that we're collecting the information, right, but it, it's how we're using it. And I think one thing that I'm really excited about is to see more people who look like me, more people who have um, had family members who have, you know, dealt with really difficult childbirth situations who mm -hmm. bring this level of empathy to the work that they're doing, right? It's more than just like another report to be run. And it, it's, mm -hmm. it's that you can also question the assumptions and really dig in and in different ways. And so I, I think about just different people being equipped to do that work, to challenge these disparities in different ways, to come up with 
unique and creative and effective ways to increase breastfeeding initiation or duration Mm -hmm. and to lower maternal mortality overall and really just almost, I mean, eliminate it. It's interesting because I sometimes wonder what, what should the ideal, we're, we're getting into statistics and we're like, there's a population average. And so I'm wondering like in an ideal setting, like what should that population average actually be for mm-hmm. maternal mortality? And so I, that's kind of when I get into my big deep thinking, but, or it's like, what, what is the impact that right now of COVID protocols where doulas aren't allowed to be in, you mm-hmm. know, yeah, in the room? So I'm, I wonder about all these things. And so I wonder about who, who is doing this work, who is asking questions differently, who is also getting, um, Sometimes it's permission, support, funding to spend time on turning questions around differently. I was just listening to um, the audiobook, The Rose Code, over the weekend. I just finished it. And I don't, I love like World War II stories when I get to see about women like being able to take on different roles. And so learning about them as code breakers and crypt, crypt analysts and all these really incredible roles that they had and how one of the really important skills was being able to look at a problem sideways. Mm -hmm. And so I am just really excited for more people coming into the field who can look at problems sideways and ask Mm -hmm. those questions that are going to help you kind of crack it open and and really make an impact in, in new ways. And so when I think about maternal and child health or any other programs, policies, projects that are aimed at leveling the playing field. I'm just really excited to support any work in that way. And when I kind of go back to my my origin as a statistician, being told I could kind of play in anyone's backyard, I think now I'm starting to ask myself, well, whose backyards do I want to play in and why? And mm-hmm. really, where do I want to focus my efforts? And so one way I do support maternal health is by donating to a podcast. So a portion of my revenue from Rose Data Studio goes to support a Black home birthing podcast every month. Mm. So I'm really proud to be able to do that. So I just think through like, again, what what are other ways? How do I show up in my workplace, advocate for Mm -hmm. maternity leave or nursing rooms or other things? How do I support others who are doing that type of work? I think we have to work kind of on all levels and all fronts to make things better. And so I I really just, I see the big picture. I'm really a systems thinker. And so um, I'm encouraged by a lot of the work that I see out there now. I'm excited to keep supporting as I can. Yeah, that's awesome. I have so many questions from what you said. Uh, First of all, uh, what's the name of the podcast? I could put it in the show notes if you remember. I think it's called Homecoming Podcast. Okay, mm-hmm. awesome. I will link to that in the oh, show notes yeah. below. That sounds like a really cool podcast. Yeah, and my other question was, oh, well, I guess it's a comment that, yeah, I think it's so great that more and more people are coming into the analytics field with such diverse backgrounds, because a lot of these technical tools, they're not, it's not, you don't need superpowers to learn them. I think everyone has the capability to learn these tools. I think what's so great is having that background, that lived experience Mm -hmm. is what really is going to help. I'm thinking of two books. Right now I'm reading a book called Reframing Healthcare. Mm -hmm. And another book that I've read was, I think it's called Range, uh, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialist. That's like my favorite book. I love love that book. Yes. (laughs) It's so so good. It's so good. (laughs) It's amazing. Yeah. I reread it like every year just to like remind myself like, this is me. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That is like me to a T. But I think that the main concept in the book is that people solve problems by they take examples from situations that they've lived or they have, and then they're able to solve problems. So if you are a farmer and then there's a math problem, like you can take experiences you have as a farmer to solve this math problem. And so I think that when it comes to maternal and child care, women who have different cultural differences and different uh, lived experiences can really take their own um, perspective. And I really think it can help uh, some of these issues that we're seeing with, you know, such high uh, preterm births surrounding Black women and things like this. Mm -hmm. So I think that, again, having these different perspectives is is so important in the analytical field. And it's really great that your company is helping people develop these tools. And there's so many other programs out there that can help people kind of develop these technical tools and, and really help to solve these issues. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think this kind of gets into one of your questions about chief encouraging officer. And (laughs) I was given that title, gosh, was it a year ago with COVID? Everything has felt so Mm -hmm. like, what what year is it? But I was given that title about a year ago from one of my peers. She invited me 
to be a TA for a data literacy class that she was running. Mm -hmm. And she was just like, I couldn't think of anybody else besides you because you're always so encouraging. And I was like, wow, that means so much to me to hear because my, my whole goal, my purpose, even when I was a TA, I always wanted to be on the introductory biostat class. I always wanted to work towards addressing statistics or math anxiety. And so mm-hmm. I'm like, if we can do that, if we can get over that hump, like you can do anything, you can do anything yes. you want to do. You don't have to do everything. And as I tell people often, I'm like, I'm not learning Python right now. I may or may not ever need it. And that's fine. I can do a lot with the tools I already know, mm-hmm. um, but you have to have enough kind of data literacy and exposure. And then to like, just build your confidence in knowing that you have a command of the things that you're, you know, interested in and the things that you need to pursue the work that you want to do, or you have enough data know-how or data speak to be able, again, speak to the statistician or whoever Mm -hmm. else, you know, is on your team that you need to interface with to to do, you know, additional work or to the data engineer who's going to pull your data for you. And so I think getting to kind of know all the different players and just kind of demystifying it is is something that I'm really excited about, especially because, yeah, this big data universe just keeps expanding. And so I've been around it for about 10 years at this point. But mm-hmm. if you're just getting into it, I can imagine how it might feel. Um, Very overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> like they're telling you, learn R, learn Python, learn exactly. SAS, learn Tableau. To learn. Mm-hmm. It's like I have other things to do with my life. I can't Absolutely. just be learning. <laughs> all these tools but it's as you're saying like just try and understand the first step just like the the language kind of the data speak like and um, there's so many resources I think that can demystify things but I think just don't get stuck almost with all this overwhelming messaging that you know kind of is pushed out that you have to be perfect in everything absolutely and Mm -hmm. I just help people navigate that and so I think too now having the experience of going out and working, like having to upskill and learn SQL for my first job that I had after I I started my leave of absence. And also realizing like they hired an experienced programmer to write like the first iteration of the dashboard data pool. They did not hire me to do that. (laughs) Like They knew the level of talent and experience that they needed. And when they're hiring for junior or senior versus lead versus they know generally kind of what they're looking for. I would say most teams know that. Mm. Um, and so I would, that's, that's another thing I would say is that people wouldn't, I, I would say that people can kind of understand what that learning curve could look like. They've hired other people onto the team prior to you, unless it's a brand new team, which at that point you might as, you know, you probably have the experience of building your own things from scratch at mm-hmm. that point. But if you're not at that, that point yet, if you're familiar, maybe you've taken a SAS class, and then you added a few R modules to transition into that space. And you're still kind of pulling all those pieces together. And I think there's enough roles out there for people at that level, as well as Mm -hmm. people who have had deeper experience and more involved with different, you know, aspects of data analysis and kind of pulling their own data versus not. I think there's so many kind of fun components where it's like you take away one thing or add another and you kind of get this picture of what's your profile. And then I'd say the last thing I'd say about that is too, once you put a whole data team together, it kind of creates this beautiful mosaic. And I got to see that uh, on Mm. my team where we had one person who had programmed in SAS probably since I was born, which is kind of ridiculous. (laughs) I'm like, what? (laughs) So, I mean, he knew so many things like the back of his hand and he had been in the healthcare space that entire time. So he knew Mm -hmm. about like the different EMRs and all. It was incredible. We had someone else who was trained similarly to me with research methods, but then had gone on to in kind of an enterprise data environment a little longer than I had. So his SQL skills were even stronger. He understood the database connections even better. And he had been in a situation where the environment was just really slow and inefficient. So he was really good at writing efficient code. I was like, Mm. wow, that's pretty incredible. Mm. I had the depth of statistical training. And then we had someone else who had a background in medical coding. And so she would ask questions that I was like, how did you even look at the, like that table and know to even ask this? Because she had been on the other side of the data input from, you know, collection in the doctor's office. And I mean, when you put a team like that together, I it's a fantastic four. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was incredible. So cool. It mm-hmm. was wonderful. And so I would say it's, again, it's, it's beyond just the data skills. It's beyond mm-hmm. how quickly and without error your code kind of runs through. It's about how, how do you all 
approach a problem and even expand the work that you're doing into new territory? How do you rely on each other? How do you check each other's code and have each other's back when it comes to those late nights <laughs> right before mm -hmm. all the reports are due? And I think we built really great camaraderie. And so I think the other kind of advice that I always try to offer and remind people is that you're going to be on a team, right? And so there's, there's that aspect too of getting to know and figure out how you can partner with your own team members, as well as those who you'll serve with reporting or dashboard or models, whatever your output or products look like. Oh, that's awesome advice. And I wanted to finalize our last question by giving a bit of advice for students or individuals who are looking to pivot into the field. What advice would you give them? Are there any skills they should learn to kind of get their, their foot in the door to, you know, a career in public health or data analytics? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm having to kind of <laughs> think through. Something that helped me a lot when I was deciding on public health, there's this book that was published remember if it was who exactly published it, but it was profiles of like a hundred careers in public health. Oh, I've seen that book on Amazon. In public health. Yeah. yeah. So I think I'll those times, because public health is so broad, I would say start, start with something like that. And now, because I guess that was like maybe, maybe 15 years ago and I was reading that book, I'm like, now go look up those people on LinkedIn who are like interesting mm. to you. I just kind of go on a little crawl like on their pages and see, oh, what have they posted about recently? Ooh, who are they connected to? Let me follow them I and mean, just start kind of taking in information and seeing what resonates with you. I think those are great ways to discover your areas of interest. And then I would say in terms of kind of getting immersed and getting your hands on some data, there's absolutely some great classes on Coursera about data analysis, like with SAS and public health. I will say, I'm, I'm not sure how it changes now that they're making some changes to SAS University. So I don't know if you're coding in SAS, like in the interface, in the web browser. So I guess you'll have to register and find out. But there's so many courses. And then I would say if there's a certain sub subspecialty or area of focus that you're interested in, maybe go to students or others who have come from departments you're interested in and ask them what tools are used um, primarily in the training, if you're you know, thinking about going to school or if you're going to work at a department of public health or CDC, find out which mm -hmm. tools that they tend to favor and try it, try them out for yourself. One great tip, and I don't know if others have shared this um, before about Tableau Public is that you can hide different dashboards until you're ready to display them on your profile. So you can work mm -hmm. on them, even if it's on the public profile. Mm -hmm. um, without having them showing. So that's, that's something I didn't know until about five months ago. And I was like, Hey, I need to make sure more people know this. So you can use Tableau for free and keep your work private until you're ready to have it as part of your portfolio. So I think there's, there's a lot of great, great training opportunities out there. There's a lot of great resources and I do think one of those profiles of public health careers is getting, I think it was either just republished or it's getting ready to be re-released. So I, I was following the author on LinkedIn and was really excited about it. So I should probably mm -hmm. follow up and go check it out now. But it's it's just, yeah, it's such a vast field. And so mm -hmm. I don't quite know exactly how I'm going to encapsulate my area of focus, even in in this kind of health policy and STEM education space. But I'd say the things I'm most interested in are in building capacity of organizations, of people to do more analytic and data storytelling work mm -hmm. and in building partnerships and giving more people opportunities to get hands-on experience and to gain just field experience with, with working uh, with data. I think it's great if you are able to put together a project or use something I know Coursera has projects affiliated with their courses, or they also have just independent projects to kind of work on just signing up directly to, for those. But there's also nothing like really being in an organization and having to, to start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think those like real world experiences are really important too. Yeah. Anywhere you can get that through a co-op or internship, but if not creating like your own portfolio project, there's a lot of open source clinical data sets that you can use, put it in Tableau. Mm -hmm. Clean it in SAS, link to that in your resume. At least you can speak to that if you get an interview 
for a co-op or internship. I think that could be like a, a good starting step because actually going through the process of cleaning the data yes. is going to tell you if you want to be in the analytical space yeah, or not. Yeah, and when they say that is the 80% of the work, they yeah. are telling the truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's something I'm really excited to focus more on working with individuals through Rose Data Studio this year is helping them with building portfolio pieces Mm. Um, because I know that's Mm -hmm. becomes important like case study you can speak to like you said in interviews Mm -hmm. Um, not just that you took the class about SAS about Tableau and here's something that I did let's go to my profile or here's the pdf of my one pager Mm -hmm. um, summarizing everything that I did awesome well thank you so much Asia for your time and your and your insights I'm I'm sure everyone is really, really gained from this episode. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This is great. Thank you for listening to the Health Analytic Insights Podcast. I'd love to hear from you about topics I should cover in future episodes. Please consider subscribing and leaving a review. Have a wonderful day.